Hello, and welcome to this Series 2 Jeremy Bamber and White House Farm podcast. I am Philip Walker, a member of the Jeremy Bamber Innocence Campaign, and I'm here with my campaign colleague, Yvonne Hartley. Hello, everyone. We're both de- delighted to be joined today by Glyn Maddox, QC. Glyn is a solicitor who has been working on wrongful conviction cases for more than 20 years, and he is a founding trustee of Appeal, which is the charity and law practice that fights miscarriages of justice. Glyn is going to talk about the work that he does with various bodies to help overturn wrongful convictions. So over to you, Glyn. Hi, hi both. Thank you very much for inviting me to to talk to you. Um, It's quite a long and complicated subject, so um, uh, I'll make a start. Um, I think my uh, involvement with miscarriages of justice probably is longer ago than 20 years. It's probably nearer 30. Um, it's, uh, it came about sort of rather serendipitously um, and not by any major intention on my part. Uh, I was working, um, and in fact, um, I'm still working as a solicitor in a small town in um, South Wales, uh, South East Wales called Krakal, and, uh, uh, and I was approached at that time Firstly, by um, a a client who I may talk to you about at some stage. Um, Sadly, he's now no longer with us. And also by um, Liberty, the the organization who wanted solicitors to join their criminal justice network. Um, I should perhaps mention that I'm not a mainstream criminal lawyer, never have been. Uh, I've never worked in Um, what I would call um, the the cutting edge of criminal law. I've done a few cases, but nothing very significant. My main expertise is in appeal cases, uh, people who have been convicted. Um, But I joined um, the Liberties Criminal Justice Network um, because I felt that, you know, they needed some help. And they sent me a few cases, a few of which were not very uh, uh, not very in, interesting or I didn't think there was any mileage in them but one of the cases was a gentleman called Paul Blackburn and I worked on his case for about 12 years and eventually managed, managed to get him A released and B his conviction quashed in 2005. Oh that's uh, fantastic. So that was that was one of my earliest earlier cases uh, successes um, but I have worked on other cases but over a period of time of working on these miscarriage of justice cases, um, appeal cases, I um, it, I came to the conclusion that the system, uh, as far as representation was concerned, I mean, I'll, I'll go into more detail in the way in which the system doesn't work very well in other ways, but certainly as far as representation was concerned, the system wasn't working very well. And that something needed to be done about that. Um, and uh, I had an idea that there needed, uh, I mean, the, the reason I said representation isn't working very well is because um, there's no money. As soon as you're convicted, the money runs out almost instantly. So no one's interested in uh, helping you. And legal terms. aid has changed considerably, hasn't it, Glenn? Over well, legal, aid, legal aid was a disaster in those days. It's even more of a disaster now. There was something called and this is for the elder, elderly ones around, or something called the Green Form Scheme, um, which uh, enabled uh, those firms that had a legal aid franchise or those firms that did criminal legal aid to do up to about £500 worth of work for someone who was claiming that they were a victim of a miscarriage of justice. Now, that doesn't get you very far. <laughs> Not at all. You can apply, or you could apply for extensions, and I think it still does exist in a very sort of rudimentary sense but it's not very it's not very satisfactory so it crossed my mind that there needed to be a way of helping people who are claiming that they were victims of a miscarriage of justice with some funding uh, and the state wasn't going to provide it so I thought some sort of charitable involvement um, would was necessary which is where I came up with the idea that we needed a, 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 a charitable law firm um, one that wasn't relying upon public funds to help those who'd suffered a, a miscarriage of justice um, or claimed that they'd suffered a miscarriage of justice. And that really led to um, the, the Centre for Criminal Appeals, which it was then known in its early days. It's now yes. known as Appeal. Uh, and I fortunately worked, or had the, shared the idea with a lady called Emily Bolton, 
um, who sort of picked up the ball, my idea, and ran with it and uh, and very effectively put it all into practice and the, an appeal started in about 2014. And has gone from strength to strength. Um, it's it, it's 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 done some remarkable work, not just in miscarriage of justice, but in you know, uh, women in the criminal justice system, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think it's. I mean, sadly, it shouldn't be necessary to have something like appeal, but it, it, it is, and it will continue to be required. And it's got you know, it's generated a lot of interest, and it's also generated a lot of. Uh, thankfully, some funding from all sorts of places, mainly legal law firms, but other grant making bodies have, have contributed. And it's, you know, over its how short life, it's done some fantastic work. Oh, this year, I ceased to be a trustee of appeal. I wanted to hand it over to other people who had more, you know, youth on their side and more ability to sort of run with it from now onwards. But I feel very proud of, of my involvement in appeal. And I think it's. Um, it's going to continue to be a very important player in the world of miscarriages of justice going forward and in law reform generally and and campaigning Absolutely. for those who are innocent. And you've um, every so, right to be proud, Glenn. It's an amazing organisation that helps so many people. Absolutely. And it's full of incredibly, you know, lively, enthusiastic, um, committed people. And I couldn't, you know, couldn't wish it a better future. And I hope it does carry on and generate the the, the 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 funds that it requires to keep it going and and we'll continue to do some good work um, and how many so people that, do you estimate that you help every year glenn sorry how many people do you estimate it's, that are helped every year it's difficult for me to give you a figure but it's very many it's a significant number of people um and um and it's you know, we, we're battling against the difficulties in the criminal justice system in terms of appeal, and not only appeal, but everyone else who, who, who sends cases to the CCRC. I mean, you know, it's a very difficult situation, and it seems to have become more difficult to get referrals through the CCRC now than it did in the early days. I mean, I, I think I, going back to Paul Blackburn, I said to him a little while ago, um, uh, uh, and I'm not sure he believed me. I said, Paul, you were extraordinarily lucky. And he said to me, what do you mean? I did 25 years in prison for something I didn't do. I said, yes, I agree with that. That was bad luck. But in terms of oh. what happened to you, you were lucky in the fact that you, you, your case was referred to the CCRC, uh, and it may not be now. You were very lucky that you had a very good court that decided to quash your conviction. That may not happen now. And thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, at the time that your conviction was quashed, you were able to claim compensation. And that absolutely wouldn't happen now, because now you have to prove beyond reasonable doubt that you didn't do it. Absolutely. And Paul, you wouldn't be able to do that. I'm afraid you wouldn't, you wouldn't have had a penny no. of compensation. So you wouldn't no, have been, you wouldn't have had your conviction quashed. You wouldn't have had, um, and you wouldn't have had any compensation. So if, you know, take it from me that, that, you know, although you don't agree with me, you were lucky. All right. Could you, could you tell us a bit on. about um, Paul's case, please, Glenn, the background and what Paul he was accused was a of? Paul was a 14-year-old boy uh, in Warrington, uh, came from a very difficult, troubled family, um, and uh, uh, a young boy in that neck of the woods was, um, went missing, uh, I think 48 hours before he was found, he was found in some sort of disused building, uh, having uh, managed to survive, even though he'd been, uh, there was an attempted murder and attempted sexual assault upon him. And Paul Blackburn was one of a number of people who were arrested. And, uh, but he was the only one who was charged with attempted murder, attempted sexual abuse on this nine-year-old child. I think Paul was, I say, 14, 15 at the time. Yeah. And effectively, a, a confession was um, dragged out of him, uh, or he, he was supposed to have made a confession, which he wrote in his own words, which turned out to be complete nonsense because young boys of, of his age and educational background do not use words such as ejaculate when they write a, 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 a statement in their own yeah. words. So um, he uh, he was sent to prison. He was a, young, a minor at the time, uh, and 
um, based upon this confession, which he subsequently retracted, there was no other evidence whatsoever, no forensic evidence, nothing. Um, so it was just based upon the confession, which was, uh, which was um, dealt with at his approved school, because he was in an approved school at the time. And um, he got lost in the system, despite the fact that the trial judge said, the one thing I want to make sure of is that you, young, young Paul Blackburn, do not get lost in the system. Uh, it was anticipated that he would do sort of, say, eight to ten years. He ended up yeah. doing 25. Absolutely Goodness outrageous. Me. Outrageous. And what year, uh, was, what year was this claim? This was 1978 that he was convicted. Um, so he spent the best years of his life in prison. In, in, uh, and this is scandalous as well. He, I think he ended up in having been to 20 prisons. Goodness me. He's, a, you know, understandably a very bitter, damaged individual who feels a massive sense of, you know, wrong. But, you know, and you ask him why he did an extra, at least an extra 10 or 15 years in prison. And he said, I couldn't own up to something I hadn't done. I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be dishonest. Um, no. So he, he spent longer in prison than he would have had he not been had he owned up to something that he didn't do him it's just and that bizarre. happens time and time again doesn't it Glenn? it happens fairly Why should you? so um so that's where we were uh, that's where we are in terms of compensation that's where, where we are in terms of the ccrc it's now um a, an organization that struggles with its resources sadly um and i'm in reasonably constant touch with the ccrc and have a good working relationship with the CCRC. And, and you know, I'll, I'll give it praise where it's due. It, it, the, all the people who work in the CCRC are doing their best, um, but against odds that are extremely difficult um, in terms of resources. They've now got a lot a smaller budget than they had five or ten years ago. Um, they haven't got a um, they haven't got the manpower that they need. And they're also constrained by their relationship with the Court of Appeal. And this is the most fundamental thing. Um, and I'm not sure if I'm straying off, off subject, but basically my take on the CCRC is that it would wish uh, to do better if it could. But it, it's always looking over its shoulder to see what the Court of Appeal is, is doing uh, mm -hmm. and will do about its, um, its referrals. Uh, and, and, and I would argue with the CCRC that if they think that the, the Court of Appeal has got something wrong, they should keep sending a case back to the Court of Appeal. But Absolutely, um, they should. But they don't. And there's only, I think, in 26 or 7,000 cases, they've only sent two cases back twice. Uh, one of them is one of my, is my case of Tony Stock, which I uh, mentioned earlier on. Tony Stock was probably my first miscarriage of justice case, and I'm still working on his case as we speak. Could you um, outline Tony's case for us, please, Glenn? Shall I tell you about Tony Stock's case? Right, Tony yes, Stock is not a, not a massively high-profile case in the sense that it wasn't a murder or anything like that. This is a gentleman called Tony Stock who <laughs> was convicted back in 1970, all right? Sounds like ancient history, of a robbery that took place in Leeds, in 1970, January 1970. Uh, and he, uh, it was an insignificant day in his life. It was his 31st birthday, the day that this robbery took place. And what happened was that a gang of robbers um, uh, jumped on the manager of the Tesco supermarket and a couple of other guys who were taking the day's takings from the supermarket to a night safe. And out of nowhere, in this sort of you know, concrete place, um, shopping centre, these guys appeared with, you know, truncheons and various implements, and they pulled the takings away from the manager and clubbed one of his accompany, accompanying people um, to the ground. And then they ran off and escaped with the, with the takings, which was about three or four thousand pounds, a lot of money in those days. <laughs> and no one else was arrested except Tony Stock, who was living at that time some way away from Leeds in Stockton upon Tees, and he was recognised apparently by one of the officers, one of the detectives, um, and because he was involved in something that had happened a year or two before, which he was found not guilty for. So he was arrested. They never found anything on him. There was no. Um, they didn't find the takings. They didn't find anything, uh, and they didn't find the other guys. All right. 
Right. So Tony Stock protested his innocence from day one. Notwithstanding that, he was um, charged and convicted and spent six years in prison. He was one of the original rooftop protesters in Gartry um, on hunger strike, etc. He had to be forcefully fed. But he did his sentence um, and came out in 76. In the meantime, his wife and four kids, you know, they he got divorced. They, they couldn't cope with it. He then started a new life in Mid Wales uh, as a carpet fitter or whatever. And two years uh, after he was out of prison, uh, a knock on the door from some TV or um, journalist saying, um, have you heard about the fact that um, a, 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 some, a supergrass has given evidence against a number of people um, for, the, for various robberies? I think they were called the Thursday Gang. And during the during the during the course of that um, those interviews with the Supergrass, he mentioned that you um, that someone had been convicted uh, of a robbery that these robbers these people had done, and he wanted to clear that up and for you to be found to be innocent. Tony Stock couldn't believe it. He just thought, oh my gosh, this is this is this is a dream come true. Someone is saying on a, um, in a witness statement. Yeah that I didn't do it and that he and his mates did, all right? And that it was a training exercise for them. And they, they, the, the, the M1 hadn't recently been, hadn't long been built. They came up from London. They were all Londoners or, you know, based in London. They came up the M1, they robbed the supermarket. It was one of their first jobs as a gang. And then they disappeared back to London with the takings. All right, gave very, very clear evidence about the, 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 shopping center about where they dropped the money the holdall containing the the weapons they would used which trains they then went back to london on etc etc even yeah. to the point where where they where this supergrass said we were hanging around for a couple of hours it was raining we got packer max you know those one pound max that people used yeah. to wear and we went into the cinema which is next door to the tesco center and we watched a film in russian uh, called war and peace all right, because it was warm in there, and we could, you know, we could we could spend yeah. some time, kill a bit of time before the rob before the robbery. So incredibly accurate information, and um, and Tony Stock thought, well, on the strength of this, I should get a Queen's pardon because he didn't know much else about things in those days. Um, and so uh, in those days, um, it, it was sent. The case was refer was uh, referred to the Home Office. The Home Office then uh, asked a retired or semi-retired superintendent to do a report uh, called the Brayson Report. That was never published, um, but on the strength of that, Tony Stock was not referred back to the Court of Appeal or for a pardon. Okay, he was right. not referred. That not is referred. just okay. Anyway, incredible. On. We're in now in the early 1980s. Tony Stock gets on with his life or tries to. He's incredibly disappointed. Obviously, there's a there's a Granada TV program about this, by the way, somewhere on the Internet, if anyone wants to watch it. And um, so he gets on with his life, finds a, 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 you know, a new partner, decides to go to South Africa to make a new life for himself. OK, he's now yeah. got two new children um, that didn't work out in the you know, when he disappears to South Africa, he decides that he's going to throw all the papers away because, you know, new start. I'm not going to get my my conviction quashed i'm just gonna have to live with it um anyway south african adventure didn't work out he then they all come back from south africa uh, and he can't get it out of his mind he can't leave it alone you know he's suffered this injustice his life he says has been ruined he's lost his first family yeah and he's, he's like a, a dog with a bone he just keeps keeps but why wouldn't you be when you wrongfully keeps agitating keeps keeps wanting to do something um, and he got, gets his local MP involved um, and his local MP writes some letters. This is the probably the early 90s to uh, the Home Office, different personnel in charge in the Home Office, different Home Secretary, different people presumably making yeah. decisions. And he comes to see me and he says, would you help me if I get this case referred? I'd I had no idea at the time what all this meant absolutely no idea about referrals about c3 division of the home office about <laughs> miscarriages of justice it was all new to me 
And uh, I said, that's fine. So I then wrote a couple of letters and I think, you know, and then one day drop, dropped into the post was a letter from the Home Secretary referring his case to the Court of Appeal. So they refused to refer it in the early 80s, but in the mid 90s, early 90s, they decided to refer it. Why? I don't know what change of heart there was, what change of policy. Anyway, um, we then um, two years later rock up at the Court of Appeal um, on the basis that this is, a, you know, a, a certainty. The Court of Appeal is just going to quash this conviction. Yeah. Um, the super grass turns up. I, I interview him. He comes up. He's in a false beard because he's worried about being shot by the people who he put away for 25 years. Uh, he did five years. Mm. The rest of his gang did 25 years. So he's a, he's been on a, um, a, a witness protection program ever since. But anyway, he wants to do the right thing. He turns up to the Court of Appeal. He's got this false beard on, which quite laughably starts to fall off <laughs> in, under the heat of the lights. Oh, I mean, dear. it's crazy. Uh, the judges listen to his evidence. We bring in other evidence um, that's new. And uh, the solicitor for the prosecution said to me beforehand, he said, this is very much, you know, a, 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 you know, something you've got this in the bag. This is this is going to must go your way, mustn't it? I don't know why we're bothering to be here. OK, nice. anyway, so uh, we 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 turn up. Uh, as I say, it's all new to me. I'm, uh, it's my first court of appeal uh, appearance for a, in a criminal matter like that. And we have Mike Mansfield, QC, dealing with it. Vera Baird, Q, who's now QC, Dame Vera Baird, she is now. Um, you know, the, the big guns. There we have uh, and as I say, this is, this is an open goal. This is someone coming along to the Court of Appeal who's saying clearly to the judges, I did it with the members of my gang. Tony Stock, that man over there, didn't do it. I've never yeah. seen him before in my life. I don't know who he is. I know that he went to prison for something he didn't do. We did it. He didn't. Blah, blah, blah. Okay? Yeah. Two or three weeks later, we get the judgment, and it turns logic upside down. It's absolutely crazy. They turn it down. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, there's a book about this by John Robbins, by the way, called... The amazing story of Tony Stock. You can get it on it and Amazon. It's well worth reading. Yeah, I'm sure all our listeners will be encouraged to, to have a yeah, read of that. Read that book, is just as it says on Amazon book. by John J O N Robbins, and it's well worth a read. It's, it's a staggering story. So, so I mean, everyone is completely bewildered. It, we're like fish, you know, with our mouths open from, from Mike Mansfield to Vera Baird to myself to the prosecuting counsel. All right, he was as surprised as we were that the judges had turned the logic upside down and uh, and that they turned the appeal down. I mean, as I say, it doesn't get much better than someone saying, I did it, he didn't. Exactly. And what, what excuse did the Court of Appeal use, Glenn? Oh, to... God. I, I mean, I, I, <laughs> they, the, 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 even though he'd given so much compelling evidence um, during the trial, of these other gang members they didn't think that he they thought he must have had some alternative ult, ulterior motive for for coming i mean it was i uh, i'm not summarizing it. it's too it's too painful and it's too ridiculous most of it was wrong they got the geography wrong they got lots of things wrong it was a it was a bizarre decision um lord justice judge was the lead judge um uh and that has caused a problem ever since anyway so we're now in 1996. Um, this is a year before the CCRC was established. And the CCRC then came into being in March to 1997. And Tony Stock being the character that he is, and was, sorry, that he was, um, uh, on the day of the Court of Appeal turning him down, he didn't, you know, go for a drink to drown his stories. He went to the various places in East London to try and find the other gang members. Right. Um, <laughs> and he found one or two of them um, um and so he, he wouldn't give up um, at that stage um despite the fact that i think it probably cost him his second marriage but anyway um people don't when you suffered a, misca a miscarriage of justice or any injustice you 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 struggle to actually put it behind you don't you absolutely anyway the the ccrc was established and i think i remember tony stock phoning me up one day um and saying what about making an application to the CCRC? I said, 
that's not a bad idea, Tony, but, you know, let's do it. But, you know, I, I'm bearing in mind the decision was only a year ago of the Court of Appeal. Yeah. I don't think the CCRC will take much of notice of it. I was actually wrong. They did pick it up. They did run with it because anyone who knows this case knows that it's a miscarriage of justice yeah. and that's what their job is. So uh, and I'll give them credit. They did a job. They referred it to the Court of Appeal. OK. Was it some new evidence, Glenn, not the same evidence? Uh, 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 yeah, new evidence because they couldn't do anything about the supergrass. They, they was friendly, but we they found more evidence about identification, photographs, and all the rest of it. So yeah. they did a, a reasonably thorough job and they referred it to the Court of Appeal. That was 2003, I think. Um, well, you won't be surprised to know that the Court of Appeal turned it down again. <laughs> all right, turned it just down again. Bizarre. Um, unbelievable. And, uh, well, you know, we had a different team. Um, we had uh, Vera Baird did it that time. I think, hang on, I've forgotten. I'm getting confused. But basically, it was turned down. Now, you may uh, ask me why they, you think it, they turned it down. I think they turned it down because of the politics of the judiciary. In other words, they probably, the judges thought the, the 1996 appeal had got it wrong, but we're not going to do... Uh, we're not going to say that uh, we're going to say that you know there's inadequate evidence or we don't believe it or whatever because, because to say that the 1996 judges had got it wrong would be to say that lord justice judge had got it wrong now yes. you've got to remember that lord justice judge was at that stage either the lord chief justice or he was going for it okay yeah. and there's a sort of um you know feeling a political decision exactly so 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 they turned it down in 2003. And this is where it becomes even more bizarre. Tony Stock wouldn't give up. Uh, and he asked me to send it off to the court of, uh, to the CCRC again. And I did. Again, forewarning him and, you know, telling him that in my opinion, I didn't think that, that, the, that they would do anything with it. But again, and I really have got to give them credit here, all right? Big time credit. They sent it back again. All right, the second referral of the CCRC uh, and the first time they'd ever referred a case twice. OK. And then it was heard in 2008 and it was turned down again. Oh. So it's now been to the Court of Appeal under under my representation three times. It was also heard in 1971 before I was involved oh, and it's been turned down on four occasions. I mean, what sort of criminal justice system is this? So the CCRC, which has been set up by Parliament to investigate cases and refer them to the Court of Appeal, if they think there's a miscarriage of justice, has referred this case twice already. And it's been turned down twice. It's been turned down three times. It's just outrageous. And I mean, it's unbelievable. Time, you've got to have fresh evidence. So you can't go back again hoping you'll get different appeal court judges because that's not how it works you've got to have yeah. brand new fresh evidence not considered before you know it's so, just it's outrageous so what, so what do you make of that so i mean it's incredibly difficult to actually put any sense to it um but as i say i i can't do anything other than give praise to the ccrc for sending it back a second time and if they send it back a third time and you never know then i will give them praise again okay no one else you can't do it Parliament can't do it. The CCRC is the only body that has the legal power to send a case back to the Court of Appeal. And, they should, and if they think that a case um, warrants it, then they should send it back time Absolutely. after time after time. And don't forget, the Birmingham Six case went at least three or four times to the Court of Appeal before it was the conviction was quashed, and that's before the CCRC. I mean, these cases, they, 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 it's, and it's about the relationship between the CCRC and the Court of Appeal that our biggest problem in this country is. Uh, the Court of Appeal is all powerful and uh, and will make decisions on, well, we don't think that this is uh, is sufficient or whatever. They don't argue, you know, they don't explain why they just have opinions which are often wrong. But yes. it's difficult to challenge those opinions. 
it's yes, a, very difficult. So it's 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 work in progress, Tony Stock, but it's an extraordinary story. And uh, and you know, the sadly, Tony Stock died in two thousand and twelve. But going back to my point about people not ever being able to to leave things alone when they've suffered a miscarriage of justice, he yeah. was uh, living at that time in a little one bedroom bed city in Landrindod Wells, and he died, and he wasn't his body wasn't discovered for a couple of days. And when they oh, when they went into his little bedsit, they found the walls covered in post-it notes about all the things that he was still trying to do to to clear his name. Oh, bless him! That is he was so spending bad. money out of his state pension on private investigators in the Leeds area at that time. It's oh, incredible, isn't it? It's oh, bless him! And is anybody still fighting his case? Me, me. You're still fighting his case. I'm still fighting. Oh, that's I'm going to go into detail place. at the moment. I'm still fighting his case, and I will let you know how we get on. Oh, amazing! Such an incredible work. It, it, it is frightening, Glenn, that at the, at the summit of our appeal system, we have such a body that is so capricious. I think absolutely, absolutely capricious and unaccountable. Yes. I mean, there is no, I mean, how often does the Supreme Court get involved? Very, very rarely. Hmm. Um, so the Court of Appeal has to uh, um, um, give leave for a case that they've desert, decided to go to the Supreme Court. And they very rarely do that. Or hmm. you can go to the Supreme Court and ask the Supreme Court to, um, you know, give leave. But again, very, very rarely, you know, the, the case is which the Court of Appeal gets wrong, do not end up in the in the Supreme Court, but they should do. And in fact, one of the things that I, I wanted the Westminster Commission to do, I don't know if we know about, or if you want me to explain what the Westminster Commission report is. Um, shall I do that? That would be excellent, yes, please. Okay, right, okay. Well, I think due to my frustrations with our fun the funding of our criminal justice system, I, um, had the idea of starting see the Centre for Criminal Appeals and then now known as Appeal. Um, but my my, uh, my frustration with the CCRC, with the Court of Appeal, with the criminal justice system, de the way in which the criminal justice system deals with the miscarriage of justice, I, I, about two or three or four years ago, I thought that we needed some more political input. So I have a very good friend uh, who's always been interested in the work that I do in miscarriage of justice, who's an MP, chap called Barry Shearman, and he said, what we need, Glyn, uh, is um, uh, an all-party miscarriage of justice group. And he, uh, you know, sent out the various um, bits of paper to various other MPs who all showed, and a large number of them showed an interest. So the group was formed, all-party parliamentary group. There are lots of parliamentary groups on all sorts of subjects in Parliament. But this one actually deals with miscarriage of justice. I'm pleased to say it's now uh, been operating for a, at least a few years. And the co-chairs at the moment are Barry Shearman and Bob Neal, Sir Bob Neal, who's uh, a, tour, uh, a Conservative MP and Chairman of the Justice Select Committee. So um, we decided that the, uh, the all-party parliamentary group was going to establish a Westminster Commission and that was chaired by Lord Garnier and Baroness Stern and they had other members as well, other commissioners, uh, with the idea of looking in depth at the CCRC and um, they came up with a report back in March, it took longer because of the pandemic than we anticipated and the report has been very well received um, apart from by the government who've just said everything's fine <laughs> we don't need to change anything um, but the CCRC have been pleased with it and I think it, it, behind the scenes hopefully it will help them negotiate some more money from the government and maybe which is what everyone wants a change in the statutory test um, the real possibility test is a problem I think everyone recognizes that um what we the threshold is just so incredibly it's, it's, high. Uh, what does it mean what does it mean exactly it's very difficult exactly. but the, you know some people would say a re real possibility is somewhere between maybe 50 and 60 percent other people would say that the ccrc are interpreting is about 75 to 85 percent i don't know um you know they, they need mm. that degree of certainty we're, we're, we're back to the relationship between the CCRC and the Court of Appeal. Yeah, um, there needs you know, to be definition, doesn't there? there needs yeah, to be I mean, if you think that um, 
uh, out of every 10 cases the CCRC send to the Court of Appeal, okay, only seven of them are successful. So three of them aren't. So that's, you know, that, that makes the mm. court, that makes the CCRC very wary of cases. It, it, it's not, there's not a hundred percent success rate. And each of those cases where the Court of Appeal turned them down, they have to think very carefully, you know, about whether they should refer again. Yeah. And, and you know, my spies have told me that whenever they get a very serious knockback, in the CCRC, then they go start going through all their cases again to think about, you know, the, the, the meritorious cases to think, well, hmm, uh -uh, we thought this was a runner, but now having read the latest Court of Appeal judgment uh, on X, Y and Z, we, we, we better think again because, you know, we would have referred this, but now we're not so sure we're going to. You know, it's that a sort terrifying of thing. thought, isn't it? It that is. Power is terrifying. Well, there's a, there's a, again, someone told me who was in the commission once that after the Idris Ali decision, I think 2016, 2017, the CCRC went into meltdown. Um, it actually was really so taken aback by the way in which the Court of Appeal um the way in which the Court of Appeal judgment was framed, that they really went into a sort of bunker and thought, oh, God, what are we going to do? We got, we aren't going to be able to refer cases, on, you know, mm. the, unless there are absolute certainties. And how many of them are absolute certainties? You know, the DNA case. Not that many of those, are there? Um, so it's it's a problem. And, and, and it is about the unfair or the... Um, the subordinate relationship that the CCRC have to the Court of Appeal, it's not equals, it's you send us cases, if we don't like them, we'll tell you to not send them again. I mean, the history of the CCRC is um, they don't now send old cases. Mm. I'm talking about, that, well, they've been told not to send old cases. I'm talking about the sort of 50s cases. Yeah, 60s cases don't send those to us we're not interested in those anymore they've been told i mean that's not parliament saying that okay but that's um, not justice either is it i mean that's uh, we don't want sentencing cases we we also don't want complicated um sort of baby shaking cases anything where the science is a bit dubious and we're having to stretch our brain a bit uh, and where we've got to you know really think uh, about you know is this scientist wrong or is that scientist wrong right we we, we don't want so please don't send us those sort of things it's too just difficult. disgusting i mean it a miscarriage is. of justice is a miscarriage of justice no matter what exactly is part of that case yeah. so you know the, the the sally cart case case you know all those sort of, they don't they don't want really those you know the that's not parliament telling this court of appeal the court that's the court of appeal making their own mind up and mm. telling the ccrc you know we're a bit sniffy about that don't bother with anything old don't bother with anything that that is going to really become complicated or difficult it seems and, as though the court, court of appeals become a lawmaking body in its own absolutely right. it's not it, right i in, mean in effect opposing imposing a statute of limitations on yeah certain yeah. cases which it has no power to I do, mean, does it? This is when you think about the early days of the CCRC. There was the, the you know, the Cardiff Somalian case, mm. whose name escapes me now. Do you remember that one? That was one of the first cases they referred. The guy that, that was hung. Sorry? Was that the guy that was hung? Yeah, that guy was hung. Yeah. Matan, I think he was called Matan. And he, you know, that was in 1952 or something. Yeah, yeah. That was one of that, I think that was the first case that the CCRC had referred. But I don't think there's anything recently that they've referred in the 50s. Yeah. Even though there were lots of yeah. miscarriages of justice in the 50s. Yeah. And it's time that they did say to the Court of Appeal, hang on, this is a miscarriage of justice. You know, the, his children of, of, of a hanged person, his children are still alive. They've got an interest in it. There's a public interest in, in it, yeah. you know. We shouldn't, we should, we, if we want to send it back because we feel there's a real possibility, we should, we should do so. Absolutely. And that's, that's about the CCRC standing up to the Court of Appeal, isn't it? And they should do that in my they opinion. They should do that. Publicly. publicly. They, do have, they do have the power to do it, don't they? It's just of course, they, they, they're the only ones who ha do have yeah. the power. So it's just lack of will on their part. Well, that's it. Than... And, and, you know, I have made this point as best I can. Um, but anyway, going back to what I was saying about the, the, the Westminster Commission, I, I was hopeful that the Westminster Commission would um, um, suggest 
or recommend that the CCRC, and this would have to be government coming from the government because it would mean change of legislation, would have the power if it wanted to, to refer a case directly to the Supreme Court. Mm. But I'm mm. afraid the Westminster Commission wouldn't go that far. Um, but there's no harm in other people calling for that if they want to. Um, and it's I think it would hugely enhance the authority of the CCRC. Uh, if they had the power, if they felt it was necessary in certain cases, and it wouldn't be every case, to say, hang on, the Court of Appeal, we think, like Tony Stock's case, we think the Court of Appeal has got it wrong. Um, yeah. Okay, w you know, we're not a court. Um, we will send it, we, we, in, we will invoke our um, a power to send this one direct to the Supreme Court. And that would be one really excellent solution to that, wouldn't it? Having well, that it would give them an additional... extra power. It would give them an extra authority. And, and I suspect that the Court of Appeal wouldn't like it. And no doubt they would lobby behind the scenes not to have it. <laughs> yeah, but, definitely. you know, it's something that could happen. And I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be. Um, but it would force the considered, court. As I said, the Westminster Commission report, were, were, Westminster Commission, were not prepared to go that far. Mm. But that doesn't mean, as I said, that it can't be campaigned for in the future. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. So, we all need to be loud about it, don't we? Make <laughs> people aware, and then people can act. Well, exactly. But I mean, in the short term, campaigning for the real possibility test to be reviewed possibly by the Law Commission is something that should be encouraged and definitely, and, and as I say, the, this, the CCRC are not against it. They would like that the Law Commission to look at the real possibility test. They, they said that in response to the Westminster Commission report, and I think they said it in relation to the uh, Select Committee report back in 2015, where I, I, I was able to give some evidence at that stage. It um, just takes so long for them to implicate these things, though, doesn't it? Well, it's, it's, it's hopeless. Wrong, I mean, our, our criminal justice system is very slow. And actually, you know, it's, it's, it's not very interest. It's, it's not of great interest to the media. Whatever happens in the criminal justice system doesn't hit the front page of the mail or the express, you know, in the way that the health service does or some, no, something in the... At the end of the day, these are people's lives and people's oh, families. Absolutely. And, you know, and in a lot of cases, there's an innocent person fighting for their justice while the perpetrator's still out there and well, never been convicted. The, the problem we have is that um, the public tend to think that we've got the best criminal justice system in the world. It's part of this sort of British exceptionalism idea. You know, we've got the best police force, we've got the best criminal justice system, mm. we've got the best health service, we've got the best scientists, we've got everything is best. And actually, when you scratch a best education service as well, but when you actually <laughs> scratch the service and you look at the evidence uh, in relation to each one of those things, um, it's not. And, and that arrogance uh, is, is, is always misplaced because it just means that we don't look at how things could be done better. And it's... it's yeah. a, a silly way of looking at things. You know, if you think you're brilliant, why bother to, you know, right. to learn anything more? It's a very it's obstructive attitude, isn't it? It's a very, very foolish national attitude um, mm. that I think has got ourselves into huge trouble in the past and will no doubt continue to do to do so. But, you know, we we we, we, we make mistakes. And in, in the criminal justice system, we certainly are not the best in the world by any means. Um, Sadly, you know, it's not something that, that that really grabs the certainly the media's attention. And they don't mind the odd miscarriage of justice if, if it's a really because when Paul Blackburn's conviction was quashed, it was a great story. And they, and they went to town in it. But they don't look at the underlying problems as to why it happened to him or the yeah. fact that no one, no one ever lost their job. No one was uh, no one had to to um, explain why he was convicted. Um, it, the whole thing is bizarre. In fact, on the day his conviction was quashed, Cheshire, I think it's Cheshire police um, who were involved. Is that right? War Warrington? Anyway, whichever police force was involved uh, gave a statement saying we're not looking for anyone else. <laughs> the standard reply, yes. Yeah. Standard reply. Now that means, OK, we think that the Court of Appeal have got it wrong. We think that Paul Blackman still did it. And we're certainly not opening it up to try and find um, the actual perpetrator who 
just bear that in mind for 25 years or longer he's now got away with doing something appalling yeah. and and there was no justice exactly. and the poor victim the poor victim i think was tracked down at one time by a journalist and he just felt really really upset about the whole thing because this is after paul blackman's conviction was quashed because in a way he felt he was somehow responsible for paul blackman being in prison for 25 years oh. for something he didn't do i mean it was it, he was in an appalling situation you know mm -hmm. some journalist said to him well what what do you how do you feel about this and he said well i feel you know heartbroken you know because mm -hmm. actually i thought at the time that he'd done it because that's he, what i was told when i was i was nine you know and you know now i'm being told he didn't do it so what am i supposed to think that the actual person who did do it is still out there and has, yeah. has you know hasn't been in yeah. prison for 25 yeah. years so there's, there's all sorts of sort, of sort of ripples that go out from these errors and these mistakes and and no one is saying and i certainly am not that you know every every system in the in the world is foolproof and that no system makes mistakes it does um but ours seems to seem to make seems to make far more mistakes than others which is not right i mean we a, a system which has to have in place uh, the criminal cases review commission isn't a system that's working very well is it when you uh, think about it logically yeah. i mean this is this is the closing the door after the horse has bolted yeah this well, is, that... this is uh, Sorry, this putting and there's a cartoon that I saw once, which actually summarizes it brilliantly. Um, there's a cliff um, and there's a fence. And rather than putting a, a fence at the top, they put an ambulance at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we hope that with Jeremy's case, you know, as and when he's exonerated, because it's so high profile, it will highlight some of these underlying... Well, I, I hope so. Each one of them that does... Um, does should highlight it and should lead to change but it you know the last time anything led to a real significant change was the the birmingham cases mm. the, the, yeah. the the irish terrorist cases nothing much else has happened since then but, but, but one of the things we had to convince parliamentarians about um when we s established this the appg was that most of them and, and I spoke to quite a number of them, thought that the problem had been solved in this country. All right? Okay. <laughs> All right? Mm. So they'll say, they'd say something like, well, explain what the problem is, because as far as we're concerned, as far as I'm concerned, um, when the CCRC was established, um, the problem of miscarriage of justice in this country has been sorted, done, done and dusted, yeah. and we'll move on to some other problem that Just needs sorting. Down, miscarriage right? of justice, we've sorted it. Mm. And you think, well, hang on a minute. Let's 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 start where 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 do we start with this? But but you know, in the old days before the CCRC, MPs used to get lots of letters from constituents, mothers, sons, daughters, or whatever, saying, you know, my father or my brother or whatever is convicted, and they used to get involved quite heavily in these cases. Yeah. Um, uh, and and be writing the letters to the Home Office and all the rest of it. As soon as the CCRC was set up, MPs aren't involved anymore, or very rarely. Okay, That's it. It so you know, so, and so so the the easy um, response from an MP to a letter from you know someone a supporter of Jeremy or whoever is well, sorry, I can't get involved in this. The CCRC yeah. is in Birmingham. Here's exactly. the address. Write to the CCRC. And, you know, and, and, you know, it's not something, it's not, it doesn't got to be on my desk anymore. Yeah. Uh, but so you, what I then had to do with quite a few MPs was to say, well, hang on, it's not working in the way that, you know, your colleagues in the, in the early 90s who, you know, set up the CCRC um, thought it was going to. It's, it, it refers three out of every hundred cases, if you're, if you're lucky. And, a year or two ago it only referred you know less than one percent um you know which means that 99 of those cases don't get referred and okay. it's short of money it has a difficult relationship with the court of appeal and it's um and it makes mistakes like every other organization so it, it part of my job as as in, in being involved with this the appg was educating mps Quite a number of them, would you believe, had never heard of the CCRC. 
Really? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Oh my Never God. heard of it. Actually, I'll go even further than that. There are quite a few lawyers who haven't heard of it, even those who do criminal law. There's, a, there's a, a, an interesting anecdote where a, a, a guy speaks to his criminal solicitor after he's convicted, and he says, hang on a minute, you know, is this is his, either his solicitor or his barrister. And he says, you know, I didn't do it. I absolutely didn't do this. I've been, you know, falsely convicted. What do I do now? And the solicitor says, I think there's some place up in Birmingham you can write to, but I, I don't know. <laughs> how, um, but, you know, you'll have to find that out yourself in prison. Bye. Uh, yeah. <laughs> hope, hope, all, hope all goes well for you in prison. Hope, hope everything's okay. And, and that's it. And that's, that's sadly, you know, because there's nothing in it for the solicitor, see? Yeah. There's no legal aid for making applications to the CCRC or most of the work done by legal representatives is done pro bono. Yeah. Absolutely. And Absolutely. interestingly, uh, and you can interpret this how you like, but most of the successful applications are with legal representation, but only about 10%, I think, I'm not quite sure what the figure is, a small, a very small number of people who are CCRC, uh, who make applications to the CCRC are legally represented. Mm. Quite a number. Mm. The majority have no legal representation so they can you can imagine some of them aren't as well educated as they could be so they just write to the ccrc yeah saying i'm I, i'm in prison here i i you know i didn't do it can you help me that's about it mm -hmm. yeah, that's why organizations such as p was so important yeah i've i've think. had those letters and you think well what are you in prison for they don't even tell you that yeah. yeah, and then you have to write mm. back and say, well, can I need some more information? I need you to tell me what you did or, and, and why you think, you know, how you can convince yeah. me that you didn't do it. Um, and they honestly, they struggle, massively struggle. A lot of struggle with reading and writing as well, which makes it twice as difficult for them, doesn't yeah, they, it? They, 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 you know, they, they just haven't got the ability to, to write. And the idea of trying to find someone outside who is going to help them, who will take the case on, who will, you know, do put the hours in to work out what happened. I mean, some of them haven't got a clue. I mean, I'll say to some clients, you know, what happened at trial? And they say, how long was it? And they'll, they'll look at you and they'll say, I don't know. I haven't got a clue. I was in sh so much shock at trial. I don't know whether it was a week or two. Um, I just sat in disbelief all the way through. I didn't understand what was they were doing. I didn't really understand the advice that I was getting. If I was getting any, I, the, the solicitor or barrister talked above my head. They didn't seem to take any notice of me. Um, you know, it's a shocking state of affairs, really. Um, it's not. It's very, not very sad. It's not just the fact they can't explain their own position. It's it's the fact they're not in a position to go and find new evidence no they're, well they're in prison for a start yeah and, exactly. and not have, have the supporters outside very you know that the lucky ones are the ones who've got someone outside who really does you know put the, put some effort in yeah. you know knock on doors and will and it's very rare that you you know in the old days you if you were lucky you've got a a, a, a a tv company you know rough justice or trial and error to actually do do the work once paul was lucky because trial and error um who i worked with for a little while were very very good and they they did some work on his case um we actually know stephen phelps oh. who did yeah i know steve phelps yeah. Era, so yeah steve, phelps, steve hayward and and um bob duffield yeah. yeah, I mean, programs like that made a huge impact on... But they were fantastic. Know. But, if, you know, I, I don't think we should need them in, in, in a proper proper criminal well, justice yeah. system. Yeah. And interestingly, I was talking to someone, in a French person, not that long ago, and it's got me thinking. And I said, she was saying, you know, she wasn't, she wasn't a lawyer or anything. She wasn't anything to do with anything that I'm interested in. But she was just fr French, and I was chatting about what I did and miscarriages of justice. And I said to her, you know, quite innocently, I wasn't a prime question. I said, what about, what about miscarriages of justice in France? And, you know, and she knew what I was talking about from living in this country for quite some time. She knew about, you know, these things that crop up on the, in the media fairly regularly. And she thought to a couple, 
you know, a few seconds and she said, and she was in her forties, I would say, and she said, I don't really think I've heard of any. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, you just think, okay. Um, so, but our <laughs> culture is about them, isn't it? Yeah. You know, we have trial and error, we have uh, rough justice, we have articles in the private eye, we have, Panorama you know, we have programs we, like that, and it's, you know, if, if, if you've got a, a Jeremy Bamber, you know, case, you've got, you've got even drama documentaries, you've yeah. got, yeah. Um, whatever, that White House Farm, you know, with Stephen Graham, the actor, That's you know, right. it's part of our culture, and it is in America as well, and, and it's part of our common law system, okay, but in, yeah. In yeah, in definitely. civil civil law system, they don't seem to have them now. Why is that? Someone, you know, one of my tasks, if I can ever get the time and the energy, is to actually try and maybe go to France or whatever and find out why they don't have them in the way that we do. Okay, yeah, exactly. What's so different? if anyone if anyone wants to fund that, you know, please let me know. <laughs> Yeah. through your podcast because i i'd absolutely love to do that and i think it's fascinating and actually it needs to be exposed why yeah. we have this huge culture of a ccrc and miscarriages of justice and all this stuff and people you know there are 1500 applicants to the ccrc every year yeah and exactly. that sp speaks volume doesn't it but, but uh, as you it say it doesn't it's, work it's in fact a damning indictment of the judiciary exactly. that they they don't seem to realise is a damning indictment that the system doesn't work, that you need to have a TV company on board or yes. you know, outside help to prove your innocence. Absolutely. And then you may not. Yeah, no, quite. No. Yes, exactly. It, it, I mean, it, it, it just, it's not working, is it? And if you started afresh designing a criminal justice system from you know, scratch, hmm. pretty sure you wouldn't design one like ours. <laughs> no. <laughs> exactly, you know, with... With with the with the theatricality of 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 our, you know, winner takes all system, you know, yeah. with the, the 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 you know, you can have a brilliant QC uh, pitched against not such a brilliant QC, one who's done all his work and one who hasn't, or she or whatever, you know, his or her, and and your life is depending upon that. I mean, I, I'll give you an example of a very experienced QC. I met for lunch once and he said to we were chatting about one of the cases I was involved with at that time and he would be he'd been prosecuting counsel and he said he had a couple of glasses of wine so he was a little bit more free with his with his chat <laughs> and he said perhaps I shouldn't say this but if your client had had a, a, a better uh, representative during his trial he wouldn't have been found guilty well okay. Jeremy was in the same position well, exactly. Now that isn't that isn't about justice, is it? No, it, uh, that's I mean, nothing to do with justice. No. That's not the evidence. That's about the performance or the skill mm -hmm. of the person or people involved in the defense or the prosecution, and it works. Exactly. Both. The courtroom is just a theater, and whichever well, exactly, and, and that's, like the that's, best, whichever but it's not you... designed for the telly for for a drama. It's designed for finding whether, whether someone guilty or innocent. Oh. And, you know, what, what they devised in, you know, 1340 or whatever, medieval times, shouldn't necessarily be the way in which we do things now, should it? No. No. <laughs> but, but, but I think a, a concept that seems to underlie a lot of this is the judiciary seem to have a subconscious belief <laughs> that they're infallible. Oh, absolutely. They do. And, completely. And, and they won't criticise other judges. Yeah. But they won't revisit their own decisions because it might show they're wrong. Uh, uh, and that, I think, is at the heart of a lot of this, isn't well, it? Well, not only that, they, they go um, to, length, to great lengths to make sure that no representative is ever criticised. Mm. OK, now, so, you know, we all know that professionals make mistakes, that they're negligent, that they fail to make the right decision. And if it's in a context of a health service you know if a doctor makes a mistake uh, or a surgeon makes a mistake then they have to suffer you know the consequences yeah, the of, a, of a negligence action all right the criminal yeah. justice system okay we have a system here in this country where it's almost impossible to criticize your barrister or your solicitor okay uh, after the event 
Okay. Mm. Um, now the reason is that the courts have decided that 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 that, that, that representatives in somehow in some sense are immune from criticism so they'll come up with all sorts of well it was a very experienced counsel at the time who had been doing this job for many years and he or she um, must have made a very you know must have made the right decision based upon all the information that they had at the time and there's no way that we're going to criticize that okay um, yeah. interestingly and i'm not the greatest a defender of the american system because it's very similar to ours in many ways but there's a constitutional right in America yeah. called uh, or a constitutional provision called ineffective assistance of counsel, OK, which is what founds a significant number of appeals in America. Mm. All right. Which effectively is your legal representatives did not do their job properly. OK. Uh, and we uh, we and we haven't got anything like that. So in America, you're legal representatives are on the line with, yeah. for the job they do and if you they don't do their job properly then you can go to the court of appeal on the basis that you weren't represented properly that they were negligent or that they were ineffective in this country even though you know we're all the same we, we, we you know there, there must be the same number of mistakes made blah 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 there's nothing Almost it's impossible. Conditions. See, I don't think I've ever, I may be wrong, I've ever referred a case back to the Court of Appeal on the basis that the representatives of the person um, did a, an appalling job. It would have yeah, to be yeah. so appalling to be, you know, newsworthy, not just that they were negligent. It would be have to be, you know, that they didn't turn up or they went to sleep halfway through the case or something that was so marked. Yeah not, yeah, not not that they didn't, you know, and and that's something that we should think very seriously about in this country. Well, and and the other thing in the U.S. system that seems to be way in advance of what we have is the Brady violation on disclosure. Yes. Oh, don't don't D disclosure is huge. <laughs> I mean, everything you can get everything in America by just asking for it here. Yeah. You, you, you ask for it and you're still told you're on a fishing expedition or we can't be bothered or we're not going to hand it over to you or whatever. There's, you know. Yes, exactly. And actually the law helps non-disclosure in this country. Mm. So, well, so, even in, in like Jeremy's case, we've got court orders made at the last appeal for full disclosure and this yeah. is probably still, still not having it. No. Still no. won't give it us. No. So there you are. I've given you a, a flavour of some of my thoughts. It's been absolutely amazing, yes. and thank you so thank much. Thank you very for much. Us. Was that okay? Absolutely brilliant, and I'm sure that the listeners out have gained a lot of insight and a lot of knowledge of Good. the work that well, appeal do. I'd be happy, happy to feedback more stuff um, and talk again if that would be helpful. All right. Absolutely fantastic. Take care. Thank you, very much. Thank thank you, you so Glenn. much, Glenn. Thank Good you. Bye bye. Bye bye. If you want to lend your support to Jeremy Bamber. You can write to him in the UK using the number A5352AC, HM Wakefield, 5 Love Lane, Wakefield, WF2 9AG, or see our website for details at www.jeremy-bamba.co.uk.